The subcommittee on oversight will come to order. Without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. Also without objection, the meeting record will remain open for five legislative days, so members may submit any materials they wish to be included therein. Thank you, Ranking Member Torres, members of the subcommittee, and our courageous whistleblowers for joining us for today's oversight hearing. These whistleblowers are coming forward today to share for the first time under oath their first-hand account related to National Guard deployment on January 6. None of today's whistleblowers were interviewed under oath by the Department of Defense Inspector General or the Select Committee. January 6, 2021 highlighted a culmination of failures at many levels. For today's hearing, we're examining the Department of Defense and the D.C. National Guard's response to the violent breach of the Capitol. So we'll get into it. I'd like to play a brief video about the, the time frame uh, of the, of the delay. Is this the video we received just this morning? Last night. I want to thank the minority for their indulgence in playing the video. I think it's important to kind of set the stage of just how important three hours and 19 minutes can be on a day like that. At a previous hearing, we heard testimony from former U.S. Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund about the former speaker and the congressional leadership delay, uh, the U.S. Capitol Police's request for assistance. On January 6, 2021, at 1.49 p.m., the D.C. National Guard received the first request for immediate assistance from the U.S. Capitol Police as protest protesters started to gather and force their way into the Capitol complex. However, at this time, the Capitol Police Board had not officially approved the request. At roughly 2.12 p.m., protesters breached the Capitol and began assaulting police officers. Staffers and members of Congress were ordered to evacuate, including myself and others that are here today. <clears throat> Capitol Police attempted to secure members and clear the Capitol, but were quickly outnumbered. <coughs> there have been many testimonies of that day, but one thing is clear. The U.S. Capitol Police requested and needed urgent assistance from anyone who would answer the call, including the Metropolitan Police Department and various federal mm -hmm. law enforcement entities and the D.C. National Guard. However, there was a delay deploying the, the National Guard for over three hours. Almost an hour after the Capitol was breached at 3.04 p.m., the Acting Secretary Defense of Defense, Christopher Miller, approved the D.C. National Guard to deploy to the Capitol. Just a brief history lesson for those who do not know. Executive Order 11485 <coughs> delegates oversight of the D.C. National Guard to the Department of Defense. A 1969 memo further designates this authority specifically to the Secretary of Army. On January 6, 2021, the Commanding General of the D.C. National Guard, William Walker, reported directly to the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy. The D.C. National Guard was at the Armory, 1.2 miles away from the Capitol, waiting for authorization to deploy to assist civil authorities and quell the riot. However, the D.C. National Guard didn't arrive at the Capitol until almost 6 p.m. That's three hours and 19 minutes of delay. During those hours, chaos engulfed members of Congress, law enforcement officers, reporters, staffers, and citizens. 
During those hours, necessary help from the D.C. National Guard was not on the way. Our goal today is to get to, bo to the bottom as to why. It took too long for the D.C. National Guard to arrive at the Capitol. The 113th Wing Capitol Guardians have a proud history of protecting our nation's capital and serving <coughs> our nation's leadership. Nevertheless, the New Jersey State Police, from nearly 150 miles away, responded to the Capitol before the D.C. National Guard. Additionally, the Pentagon knew that there was a threat to governmental operations because by 3.37 p.m., the Pentagon sent its own security forces to guard the homes of defense leaders. At 3.37 p.m., no, no D.C. National Guard forces were on the way to the Capitol. Throughout my subcommittee's extensive investigation into the events of January 6 and the Select Committee on January 6, we have uncovered concerning inconsistencies regarding the mobilization of the D.C. National Guard. Through phone records, firsthand accounts, sworn testimonies, and after-action reports we have gathered, there appears to have been a significant delay at the Department of Defense in either deploying the National Guard or communicating the order of deployment. Either way, the purpose of this hearing is to hear the D.C. National Guard story for the first time ever about the three-hour and 19-minute delay. On November 16, 2021, the Department of Defense Inspector General released a report reviewing their role in the response to, the January, to January 6, which claimed that the D.C. National Guard was deployed to the Capitol as quickly as possible. However, the report also credited significant delays in deployment to, to D.C. National Guard, commanding General Major General William Walker, neglecting to mobilize after receiving orders. Specifically, the DODIG report concludes that the leader of the National Guard response, Major General Walker, received direction from the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, to deploy the D.C. National Guard to the Capitol twice, once at 4.35 p.m. and again at 5 p.m. Major General Walker denies that either of these calls took place. Despite the many inconsistencies and contradictions of the Department of Defense's responsibility that day, the Select Committee on January 6 ignored these discrepancies despite them being shared privately by their own staff and barreled forward with the DOD's side of the story. Following the release of the DOD IG report, multiple whistleblowers from the D.C. National Guard who were present with Major General Walker have come forward to share their experiences. According to their testimony, Hours of vital response time were missed because senior Army officials had personal concerns regarding military presence at the U.S. Capitol. Today, we have the responsibility of recognizing these D.C. National Guardsmen, listening to their testimony, and honoring their patriotism. These brave men who showed up to defend the Capitol and were discarded and ignored when they tried to come forward. I reached out to the DOD IG regarding concerns with their report and contradictory narratives. For nearly two months, I have not received any answers. Today, we will learn more about what happened that day regarding the delay. We'll hear a side of the story that has been ignored for too long. Most importantly, today, we will look into the future and make sure that our capital, our capital guardians, and our law enforcement partners are more prepared today than they were three years ago. We're only able to conduct this oversight because whistleblowers have come forward to share their stories. I encourage anyone to reach out to the subcommittee as our investigation continues. I now recognize Ranking Member Ms. Torres for five minutes for the purpose of providing an opening statement. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today and for your service to our nation, particularly on January 6th. You sacrificed your time to protect us, and we owe you a debt of gratitude. Uh, we are here today discussing the delayed National Guard response to the Capitol for one reason and one reason only. Donald Trump dispatched an armed mob to try to overturn the election he knew he lost. And for three hours and 19 minutes, as that violent mob <coughs> assaulted law enforcement and hunted <coughs> for members of Congress and the vice president who they were trying to hang, the National Guard was forced to wait and wait and wait all because of the chaos at the Pentagon caused by the Commander-in-Chief and the fear that he would involve the military in domestic political affairs, a big no-no we teach worldwide to emerging countries. This was a Commander-in-Chief who, as the riot unfolded, didn't call his acting Secretary of Defense or Secretary of the Army to ask why the National Guard was missing. Where were they? A commander-in-chief 
who after he learned someone was shot, didn't care. He didn't call the National Guard directly. A commander in chief whose aides and family partied and danced as the mob prepared to overturn the Capitol. A commander in chief who sat in his dining room watching it all unfold on TV like it was an action movie with an ending favorable to him. How did we get here? Let me tell you. In response to the June 2020 demonstrations responding to the murder of George Floyd, President Trump said he would, quote, deploy the United States military, end quote, to put down the protest and even ask Secretary of Defense Mark Esper why the military couldn't just, quote, shoot the protesters in the legs or something, end quote. Secretary Esper found the president's comments so disturbing <coughs> He held a press conference saying he opposed invoking the Insurrection Act. Then, in December, as Trump continued to spread conspiracy theories um, supported by members of this Congress sitting here today about the election being stolen, talk of invoking the Insurrection Act reached a boiling point. It got so bad that his own Secretary of the Army and the Army Chief of Staff, a four-star general, issue a joint statement saying, quote, there is no role for the U.S. military in determining the outcome of an American election, end quote. And as our top military leaders worry the president will declare martial law, the rest of the national security apparatus was in total disarray. People were getting fired or resigning, left and right. Everyone remembers that, right? And with only 71 days left in his term, Trump terminated the Secretary of Defense and replaced him with an acting Secretary of Defense who was completely, completely over his head. Contrary to attempts to rewrite history, the January 6th Select Committee conducted more than two dozen interviews and, and, and reviewed over 37,000 pages of documents related to the National Guard and dedicated 46 pages of its final report to this issue. The Select Committee found that the chaos led to an ill-equipped acting Secretary of Defense issuing an unclear order to the Secretary of the Army, an order so unclear that it was interpreted differently by the <coughs> Acting Secretary of Defense, the Army Chief of Staff, and the Secretary of the Army. Three people, three different interpretations. It's all there in the Select Committee's final report and the dozens of relevant transcripts available online. Adding to the chaos, these top Army officials exercised extreme caution and imposed unprecedented restrictions on when and how to deploy the Guard on January 6. This was the direct result of the President's decision to involve the military in domestic affairs. <clears throat> to our witnesses, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that Trump's Defense Department and Army leadership failed you and they failed us on January 6. You should never have been forced to sit on your hands while we were lying on our stomachs, planning to use a pen in our purses as a weapon to defend ourselves against the mob that was sent here to kill us by the President of the United States of America. We were preparing to die. I yield back. The gentlelady yields. Uh, chair now recognizes the full committee ranking member, Ms. Morelli, for five minutes for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses um, for your careers of distinguished service. The <coughs> D.C. National Guardsmen are known as the Capitol Guardians, and uh, we as members are only able to do our jobs in the days and months that followed January 6th because you stood guard over us as you did, and uh, for that, and for all of your long service, we owe you an enormous uh, debt of gratitude, so thank you. Um, I, I want to be clear. We're here today for a single reason, 
an unpatriotic, cynical, power-hungry man incited a deadly insurrection as part of his months-long effort to overturn a free and fair American election. We're here because of his lies about the 2020 election. It's hard to believe. It's frankly even hard to say, but it doesn't make it any less true. Yet many cannot bring themselves to acknowledge it, many in this room. As a result, we're here because of the majority's 15-month quixotic mission to find malfeasance from the January 6th Select Committee who invested, investigated the insurrection where no malfeasance exists. And frankly, just as a question of jurisdiction um, should be raised, if this hearing is about the chain of command and or communication between the various elements of the defense apparatus of the United States, then it falls to the House Armed Services Committee to do that investigation. Um, they should be doing it, <coughs> I do agree, but this is clearly not the venue for uh, this to happen. Um, I do want to address something at the outset. There is a notion that persists that President Trump ordered or pushed for 10,000 National Guard troops ahead of January 6. It's been debunked repeatedly, and it's also a red hearing, and here's why. As the chair has stated, a 1969 executive order delegated authority over the D.C. National Guard to the Secretary of Defense, who in turn delegated that authority to the Secretary of the Army. But the President of the United States ultimately sits atop the chain of command. What he did with the National Guard before January 6 doesn't matter compared to his actions, or I should say inactions, on the 6th of January itself. And what he never did on the 6th was call the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, or the D.C. National Guard itself to find out why they were not on the scene or to order them to the Capitol for that three-hour and 19-minute delay. So I want to quickly dispense with the claim once and for all that he'd ordered 10,000 troops, as he has said. Acting Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller was asked the following questions and provided the following answers under penalty of perjury. First question, the 10,000 troops, did you take that as a request for you or an order for you to deploy 10,000 troops? His answer, and I quote, no, absolutely not. I interpret it as a bit of presidential banner or President Trump banner that you're all familiar with, and in no way, shape, or form did I interpret that as an order or direction. <coughs> he was also asked, in February of 2021, Mark Meadows said on Fox News that, quote, even in January, that was a given as many as 10,000 National Guard troops were told to be on the ready by the Secretary of Defense. Is, that any, is there any accuracy to that statement? Mr. Meadows' answer, not from my perspective. I was never given any direction or order or knew of any plans of that nature. So no, there was obviously we had plans for activating more folks, but that was not anything more than contingency planning. And then a few questions later. To be crystal clear, the question was, there was no direct order from President Trump to put 10,000 troops to be on the ready for January 6th. Is that correct? His answer, quote, that's correct. There was no direct order. There was no order from the president. I think that's all you need to know. Under oath, the Secretary of Defense said it never happened. Here's the bottom line. The President of the United States manipulated his followers into believing the election was stolen from him, summoned an armed mob to Washington, and then unleashed them on the United States Capitol and then did absolutely nothing to stop what unfolded. People died. We almost lost our democracy. We could have a hundred hearings to deflect blame, but the facts are not going to change. President Truman famously had a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here. President Trump's sign, on the other hand, would read, the buck stops anywhere but here. He lit the fire, he fanned the flames, the Defense Department delayed the troops, and he wants everyone else to take the blame. Frankly, I find it pathetic. I agree with Senator Mitch McConnell, who said former President Trump's actions preceding the riot were a disgraceful, disgraceful dereliction of duty. Former Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Trump bears responsibility for his actions, no if, ands, or buts. And I agree with Senator Lindsey Graham, who said, all I can say is count me out, enough is enough. I only wish that they and the rest of the Republican Party agreed with their prior versions of themselves. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields. Um, just uh, for the record, uh, this, this hearing is not being done in isolation. It's been carefully uh, 
uh, coordinated with the House Armed Services Committee and uh, not only has her blessing, but a bipartisan blessing to, uh, to hold this hearing. Um, also, uh, uh, without objection, I'd like to submit for the record uh, Secretary Miller's uh, transcribed interview under oath uh, to the Select Committee on January 6th. Um, two excerpts. So, Mr. Miller, did you try to read? Well, let me back up. On January 3rd, did you have, or even prior, did you have all the authorities needed in terms of activating, deploying the D.C. National Guard? Um, and he said, yes, I felt I did. Did you need any additional authorities, or was there a discussion about your authorities in any way at the January 3rd meeting? No, I didn't. I felt like I had all the authorities I needed and did not need to discuss anything with the President regarding authorities. Another question. So, Mr. Miller, did you try to reach President Trump that day? I did not. Why not? I had all the authorities I needed to perform my duties, responsibilities that day, and didn't need any other guidance from the President. I now recognize uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes for an opening statement. And let me start, Mr. Chairman, by submitting for the record the Army timeline of events from December 31st, uh, 2020 through January 7, 2021. That report dated January 7, 2021. Without objection. I find the, some of the comments this morning interesting. Uh, because I, too, was on the floor that day. And I find it interesting because there's an allegation that the commander-in-chief has to call everybody who's in the chain of command to make sure his orders are followed. It is my understanding, and I believe that the evidence today will show from these gentlemen who have given their time and are whistleblowers, meaning they're coming forward with something that other people may not want to have heard, that we will discover through their testimony that, in fact, uh, the President had given the instruction, perhaps un misunderstood on January 3rd, but certainly on January 6th, uh, prior to that instruction being relayed by his officers in accordance with the general military procedure to the D.C. National Guard. And uh, that's a big part of what this hearing will be about today. Um, and I think it's important that we keep that in mind. Further, we've heard a lot about the attempts to uh, rewrite history because the January 6th committee is allegedly supposed to have already done all of this. But we will hear, I believe, from these gentlemen today that they were not talked to by the January 6th commission. And further, that commission will forever in history be tainted because it was the first time in history in an attempt to write the history after the fact that both sides, both major parties in this political situation that we find have found ourselves in for the last 175, 200 years, both were not in, invited to participate in an equal manner. That the Republican representatives who were supposed to be on that, who was originally set up, were supposed to be a part of the January 6th committee, were not allowed to be present. They were not allowed to cross-examine witnesses. They were not allowed to ask for witnesses like these four brave gentlemen who are here with us today. They weren't allowed to call those witnesses to appear in front of the January 6th committee. So while the January 6th committee may have found some very interesting information, they intentionally chose not to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, at the very best, it can be described as a partial attempt to put forward facts that favored their side of the narrative and not to get to all the facts. And as Jack Webb and his famous character from Dragnet used to say, the facts. We just want the facts, ma'am. That's what we're here to do today, is to try to make sure that we're getting to the facts, not the political rhetoric, not the emotions per se, but the facts from four brave gentlemen who serve our nation and have served our nation, who have come forward. I don't know any of these gentlemen. I don't believe any of them has a political ax to grind. They are here just to deliver the facts. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. today. Pursuant to paragraph B of Committee Rule 6, the witnesses will please stand and raise your right hand. Absolutely. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show the witnesses have answered in the affirmative, and you may be seated. I will now introduce each of our witnesses. Our first witness is Command Sergeant Major Michael Brooks. <coughs> Command Sergeant Major Brooks' military career spanned 29 years with combat tours in Iraq. Command Master Sergeant Brooks spent the end of his career in the D.C. National Guard, including at the Joint Task Force D.C. Mr. Brooks now works at a company that seeks to protect national and economic security from undue foreign influence. On January 6, 2021, Mr. Brooks was a senior enlisted advisor to Major General William Walker and advised on all enlisted matters. Our next witness is Colonel Earl Matthews, a decorated military veteran with a long and accomplished career in government and the private sector. Colonel Matthews served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Defense Policy and Strategy on the National Security Council staff. He also served as the Army's Acting General Counsel and Principal Deputy General Counsel, as well as the Deputy Legal Counsel to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. On January 6, 2021, Colonel Matthews was the Chief Legal Advisor to Major General William Walker and was with him all day. Our next witness is Brigadier General Aaron Dean with a similarly accomplished career in military service. Brigadier General Dean served in Operation Desert Storm and a combat tour in Iraq. He also served in the D.C. National Guard for over 35 years, exemplifying what it means to be a Capitol Guardsman. On January 6, 2021, Brigadier General Dean served as Major General Walker's Adjutant General and Principal Advisor. Our final witness is Captain Timothy Nick, an active duty service member in the Florida National Guard. Captain Nick has experience in law enforcement, including as a current officer in the U.S. Secret Service. Captain Nick previously served in the D.C. National Guard's <coughs> Public Affairs Department. On January 6, 2021, Captain Nick was the aide-de-camp to Major General William Walker and took detailed notes of actions of Major General Walker on that day. Thank you, gentlemen, for your service to our country and your strength and courage to come forward and share your accounting of events on January 6, 2021. We all look forward to your testimony. As a reminder, we have read your written statements, and it, they will appear in full in the hearing record. Under Committee Rule 9, you are, limit, you are to limit your oral presentation to a brief summary of your written statement, unless I extend the time period in consultation with Ranking Member Torres. Please remember to turn on your microphone using the button in front of you so that members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light on the timer in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow. When the red light comes on, your five minutes has expired, and we just ask that you please wrap up your comments at that moment. I now recognize Command Sergeant Major Michael Brooks for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Laudermilk, Ranking Member Torres, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Command Sergeant Major Retired Michael F. Brooks. I am the former Command Senior Enlisted Mr. Leader. Brooks, could, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you pull the microphone a little closer to you? People in the audience are having a hard time hearing. I apologize for that. You can start over, and we'll reset your time. <coughs> Thank you. Is that better? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Ch Chairman Loudermilk, Ranking Member Torres, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Command Sergeant Major Retired Michael F. Brooks. I am the former Command Senior Enlisted Leader of the District of Columbia National Guard, the Capitol Guardians. I retired on March 1st of 2023 with 29 years of active federal service in the Army and the Army National Guard. While I am no longer in service, I continue defense of our great nation as a compliance and investigation specialist with the Compliance and Adjudication Division of the Office of Information and Communications Technology and Services of the Bureau of Industry and Security. I subvert <clears throat> I served as the Command Senior Enlisted Leader of the D.C. National Guard from December 2017 to December of 2022. As the most senior non-commissioned officer in the organization, I reported directly to Commanding General and from 2017 until his retirement and selection as the 38th Sergeant at Arms for the House of Representatives, my commander was Major General William J. Walker. As his senior enlisted advisor, I reported only to him and I was with him throughout the days before the day of and the sub subsequent weeks and months that followed the events of January 6, 2021. So imagine my surprise when the DODIG released their report 
without once interviewing myself or other critically significant D.C. National Guard members with firsthand knowledge of what occurred that fateful day. Not anonymous witnesses or anonymous officials, but senior ranking military members that were in the room, on the calls, and on the secure video teleconference. I'm not here to disparage the Army that I love and served for nearly three decades, but to correct the record and speak for the hundreds of enlisted soldiers and airmen of the D.C. National Guard who have always answered the call to serve without political bias or prejudice, who have always faithfully fulfilled their oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Those Capitol Guardians who continue to do so even today after being degraded by senior officials of the Army and the Army staff in their inaccurate and biased report. I believe those who steered the narrative of the DODIG report did so not for historical documentation or to enhance future military responsibility capability, but to protect and advance individuals who sought to shield themselves from responsibility, to overly enhance their role and perceive significance in a critical moment in the history of our nation's democracy. In, their tru in truth, their actions, no matter how innocent they believe them to be, have led to an awful mark on our military and shown an incredible lack of respect for the service of the men and women who serve in the D.C. National Guard before, during, and after January 6, 2021. Trust in our Army's most senior leadership was lost. Their actions and comments have highlighted the Army staff and the Secretary of the Army's lack of knowledge and understanding of the D.C. National Guard, its authorities, and capabilities. Prior to the protests following the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, I do not believe any of them understood just how unique the D.C. National Guard is and the responsibility <coughs> that is delegated from the President to the Secretary of Defense and further delegated to the Secretary of the Army. I believe it is this lack of understanding that led to the significant delays in the military response on January 6th. I will not sit here today and say if we had been given authority to immediately respond when Chief Sun the chief of the Capitol Police made that first frantic call for support at 1.49 p.m. that we would have prevented the breach of the Capitol. What I can tell you with absolute certainty is that we had a force equipped and ready to respond. And that despite the inaccuracies of the DODIG report, we had a plan and would have liked the opportunity to try. Instead, we waited for hours, less than two miles east of the Capitol, knowing our Capitol had been breached and not understanding why we had not received the authorization to respond. I cannot tell you the number of times someone has asked me, where were you? Where was the National Guard? Or how can you call yourselves Capitol Guardians? There is no easy response to those questions, and the truth is, we were there, and we were ready. We just weren't authorized to respond, and that is difficult to explain. The soldiers and airmen of the D.C. National Guard deserve better. They deserve to be recognized for their sacrifices over a prolonged period of civil unrest from May of 2020 to May of 2021. I look forward to your questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I now recognize Colonel Earl Matthews for <coughs> five minutes. Chairman Laudermilk, Ranking Member Torres, members of the subcommittee. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Earl Matthews, and I'm a colonel in the United States Army Reserves. I'm in the 25th year of my military service. I love our Army, and I'm committed to our Army values. I'm here today because two... I'm here today because two senior general officers of the United States Army, General Charles A. Flynn and Lieutenant General Walter E. Pyatt, have acted contrary to those values. Generals Pyatt and Flynn have lied to Congress, to federal investigators, and to the American people about why it took so long for the District of Columbia National Guard to deploy <coughs> to the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Their distortions contributed to the, a deeply flawed, a, a deeply and fundamentally flawed Department of Defense Inspector General investigation and to deficiencies in other official inquiries. On January the 6th, 2021, I was on duty and present during numerous conversations, video conferences, and phone calls leading up to, during, and after the riot, which was 
which was engulfing, <coughs> which was engulfing the Capitol. Uh, when I say these general officers lied, I do not do so lightly or cavalierly. I speak from personal knowledge, having interacted with them on January the 6th in my official military capacity. Unfortunately, some senior officials within the Department of the Army and the Department of Defense have sought to protect or to promote Generals, Fl uh, Generals Flynn and Pyatt. These senior civilian officials have excused, condoned, <coughs> or overlooked the misconduct of these officers. As a former acting general counsel of the Department of the Army and its chief legal officer, I take these matters seriously, even if others don't. I'm glad the subcommittee has, open, has an open mind and is committed to the dogged search for the truth. In my formal statement, which I provided to the committee in advance of today's hearing, I detailed General Pyatt's and General Flynn's intentional misrepresentations to the Congress and to federal investigators. During today's hearing, I hope to discuss with you how they lied, where they lied, and in my opinion, why they lied. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Matthews. I now recognize Brigadier General Aaron Dean for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. Good morning, I'm Brigadier General retired Aaron Dean. Let history record this moment as I, in my capacity as the second in command of the District of Columbia National Guard, entrusted with the sacred duty to advise and assist the commanding general on matters of operational significance concerning the deployment of the District of Columbia National Guard on January 6, 2021, address the grave assertions and inaccuracies contained in the Inspector General's report, DOD IG 2022-039. I believe it is my duty and moral obligation to stand before you today and illuminate the truth. I stand resolute bearing witness to the unwavering readiness and unparalleled dedication of the service members of the District of Columbia National Guard. I will answer questions honestly, as witnessed through the lens of my 34-year career in the District of Columbia National Guard. I rebuff in the strongest terms the insidious insinuation that the District of Columbia National Guard faltered in its duty, that it languished in apathy or incompetence when called upon to safeguard the sanctum of democracy. Today, I will tell the truth to the best of my recollection, unblemished by falsehoods, and in doing so, exonerate the honor of the brave soldiers and airmen who stood unwavering in the defense of our nation. May my testimony serve as a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who answered the call of duty on that historic day. Thank you. Thank you, General Dean. Now recognize Captain Timothy Nick for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Timothy Nick and I'm a captain in the Army National Guard. I'm here today to aid the subcommittee in resolving factual errors in the official record of what happened on January 6, 2021, <coughs> specifically regarding the alleged District of Columbia National Guard delayed response caused by critical presidentially appointed Senate confirmed Pentagon senior officials. I was concerned by the events that unfolded that day on the United States Capitol. As a federal officer of the United States Secret Service and a former state trooper with the Florida Highway Patrol, my heart goes out to all law enforcement officers, sisters and brothers that held the line that day to restore public order to the chaos. I'm here today with my counsels, Lachlan McKillen and Dan Meyer of law firm Tully Rickney. The firm has advised me beginning with my role as a co confidential source to the select committee to investigate the January 6 attack on the United States Capitol. When my confidentiality was breached, it was Dan who, who intervened to ensure I was protected as a military whistleblower. First, I want to explain my role on January 6. I was assigned as aide de camp, the personal assistant to Major General William Walker, the commanding general of DC National Guard. It was my only second day on the job. Please focus on alleged facts about found in the November 16th, 2021 Department of Defense Inspector General's multidisciplinary review into the DC National Guard response in Department of Defense's role that day. I can say unequivocally that the Inspector General's review is riddled with inaccuracies, misstatements, and perhaps false flags and narratives regarding how critical Pentagon senior officials responded when our republic was under great stress. 
For instance, during a conference call at 2.31 p.m. with members of the United States Army, U.S. Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police Department, District of Columbia Government, and U.S. Secret Service Uniform Division, the U.S. Army's Lieutenant General Walter Pyatt, Director of Army Staff, and the Army's Lieutenant General Charles Flynn, Director of Chief of Staff of Operations, were on the call. Also on was Colonel John Lubis, Executive Officer to the Secretary of the Army. The Army falsely denied that General Flynn was ever on the call. This is false and material on its face. Lieutenant Flynn was on the call and even participated in discussions. The Defense Inspector's Review also rounds language, papering over the fact that Lieutenant General Pyatt and Lieutenant General Flynn, while on the call, discussed how they did not like the optics. That is a direct quote. And they stated it would be in their best military advice to recommend to the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, to deny the request from Command General William Walker to deploy the D.C. National Guard and aid U.S. Capitol Police in restoring restoration of order, liberty on Capitol Hill. In addition, former Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy claims he was on a 2.31 p.m. call and spoke on that call. This is false, unless he was in the room shadowing the call and he did not speak nor identify himself. He was not on the call. He was en route to Washington, D.C. Regional office at the Federal Bureau of Investigation to support that agency's concept of operations plan for January 6. He went on to claim that he called and spoke to Major General Walker at least twice, ordering the deployment of the D.C. National Guard. This is also false. At no time did General Walker take any calls, nor do we ever hear from the Secretary on any of the ongoing conference calls or the secure video teleconferencing throughout the day. This I know because I was with the Command General the entire time recording events. Throughout the day, Major General Walker told by staff officers to stand by with respect to deploying to the Capitol Hill. Only at 5.09 p.m. in the early evening, which I wrote down in my wheel book, was the D.C. Guard given order to deploy and move to the Capitol to assist Capitol Police. We arrived too late. One American lay dead with other sisters and brothers injured, including federal and local law enforcement officers. We were ready and standing by. I know if we were able to deploy immediately when General Walker made the request, the National Guard could have helped end civil disturbance and restored public order quickly. The Army National Guard motto is always ready, always there. The D.C. National Guard was ready to help and assist Capitol Police, but we were not allowed to do our job due to paralyzed decision-making by Acting Secretary of Defense Chris Miller and Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy. This led to federal leadership in the Pentagon this led to a crisis in federal leadership at the Pentagon and delayed the D.C. response by three hours and 19 minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and articulate the facts as they happened. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Captain. And uh, as we begin our question session, I want to reemphasize how much we appreciate uh, all of you coming forward. I know as a veteran of the Armed Forces myself, this takes a, an incredible amount of courage. Uh, to come forward and tell the truth. Uh, we'll now move into the question session, and I begin to... Okay. Yeah, just a reminder that make sure the microphones are very close to you uh, during this time. I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. We have a sergeant major, a colonel, a brigadier general, and a captain. Your testimony is compelling. Thank you. Now to the questions. On January 6, 2021, were each of you gentlemen with Major General, General William Walker from 1.49 p.m. through 5.55 p.m., yes or no? Yes, I, I was. Yes. Yes. The Department of Defense Inspector General report, DODIG report, alleges that the Secretary of Army contacted Major General Walker multiple times on January 6 during that time frame. Some allegations are two calls, some are three. But the allegations would be, or the assertions would be, 3.04 p.m., 4.35 p.m., and finally at 5 p.m. Do any of you recall any one of those calls uh, taking place? Uh, negative, sir. Can I amplify that, though? Yes, sir. So uh, by way of background, I, so I was, a, I was a political appointee in the Trump administration. I was a senior political appointee. I was also, a guard, I was also in the Army Reserve and National Guard. Now, in June of 2017, I was appointed to be Acting General Counsel of the Department of the Army. The, the next month, Ryan McCarthy was appointed Acting Secretary of the Army. He had, he'd been confirmed as uh, Under Secretary of the Army. So Ryan McCarthy was my colleague. He was my friend. I, I told the committee he was a good Secretary of the Army. I, 
I had a great deal of affection for Ryan McCarthy. I know he did for me. So I'm not here to bat him off Ryan McCarthy, <coughs> but I, I've got to set the record, record straight. Yes, now, sir. I, in my memo, I didn't call, I never caught, I caught Pi and Flynn liars. I never caught McCarthy a liar for two reasons. One, it wasn't clear to me that he was saying some of the things they said he said. I mean, it, it, it appeared to me that some of the things they said he said were said by others who were trying to really protect themselves. The other thing was, he was my friend. You just don't turn it off. You don't call your friend a liar. So, you know, uh, but at, at 2.30, at 2.31, they, they, or sorry, at the 2.30, they said that he was on a call with, the, with, with uh, General Walker, and he told him to move the QRF to the armory. I mean, that, that did not happen. Um, Ryan McCarthy didn't speak on that call. And we know this because that, that call was on a conference bridge. It was a D.C. government conference bridge. Now, the DOD IG incorrectly states that McCarthy requested the call. I, I helped facilitate that call. Uh, General Walker was on a call with uh, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, who was the uh, Homeland Security Advisor for Mayor Bowser. Uh, Mayor Bowser was on a call. Chief Sun was on a call. Chief Conti was on a call. All of us uh, at this dais were all on a call. Ryan McCarthy never spoke on that call. I'm, I'm a person who was his friend who knew his voice quite well. If he had said anything, I would say that. We were told he was unavailable. I, I called this executive officer to ask to speak to him, and we were told he was unavailable. General Walter Pyatt and General Charles Flynn were, were on the call. Subsequently, Flynn denies he was even involved in the call. For, for what reason, I really don't know. Uh, he, he did so under oath. And um, Commander Sergeant Major Brooks, myself, and Lieutenant Nick were all interviewed by the Select Committee. We told him that. I, to me, this is material because Flynn denied under oath twice to the uh, House Oversight Committee and to the Select Committee that he, he was even participated in the call. That goes to his integrity, to his credibility. All right, and, let and me, I, and I, and I, and I'm sorry, let, me let me underline this. Colonel, you are also an attorney. Yes, sir. With you got your license. degree from Harvard Law School. Yes, sir, I got a mortgage in Great Falls, Virginia. I have no reason to be up here lying because I don't want to go to federal prison. And you understand that you are, uh, you if you lie to Congress, 18, Title 18, 1001 makes that a crime. Is that correct? Un unquestionably, sir. And, we're, and you, you also understand that as a member of the legal establishment, that if you were to lie under oath, your license to practice law, no matter the fact that you have a JD from Harvard, could be in jeopardy. Is that no correct? No question, sir. And, sir, I want to point out. Yes, sir. Uh, I spoke to the select committee. I was not under oath, but it doesn't matter because you don't have to be under oath. If you lie to Congress, you're still a federal crime. Yes, and sir. And I'm fully aware of that. And I submitted a document stating that these men were liars, and I stand by it 100%. And it's the stand on my army that they, that they got away with it, and no, no one said anything about it. And in, and, and they, they even sent Pi's name to the President of the United States to have him promoted. He's a lot, he was a liar. And so, and all of us can attest to that. And you want the truth to come out? No, no question about it, sir. Good, bad, or ugly, correct? Exactly. Anybody here want anything but the truth? Any of the four witnesses want anything but the truth to come out? No, sir. Good, bad, or ugly, doesn't matter. No matter what side you're on. Is that correct? I heard a, yes, a no, sir. Yes, you sir. You want the truth? Yes, sir. Nothing but the right. truth. Yes, sir. Yes. Colonel Matthews, correct. Brigadier General? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I don't know. I got lots of other questions to ask, but I appreciate you jumping in and, and, and clearly with your heartfelt emotions telling us that things weren't exactly true and that, the, in fairness, the January 6th committee was not told the truth. Is that correct, Colonel? Uh, well, we t so they were not told the truth, but uh, but I think they knew that, though, and they dis disregarded that, and, and this is what, what I mean. Um, so. General Flynn testified before the House Oversight Committee on June 15th of 2021. Uh, during his opening statement and during uh, his questioning, he, was, he, 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 he stated explicitly that he was not on that phone call. He made no statements on that call. Subsequently, he was interviewed by the January 6th Committee, and he also stated, he was di directly asked by the Senior Investigative Counsel, did you make any statements on that call? He says he did not. He was not on the call, he says. Now, that is perjury, in my opinion. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but it's for court to decide. But to me, that's perjury. But the, the important point is, later, I, I raised that. I was interviewed by the select committee. Uh, in unfortunately, December. my time is up, but hopefully you'll get another opportunity to okay. talk about it. Right. I apologize. My time is up. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman yields, and I recognize the subcommittee's ranking member, Ms. Torres, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Colonel Matthews, yes, um, I spent 
um, more than 17 years as 911 dispatcher. I worked through some very difficult times in the city of LA, um, Rodney King riots, the, the verdicts. Uh, on 9-11, I was tasked with putting together mobile field force uh, units to dispatch to critical locations to ensure that um, those would not be attacked. So I know what an EOC is supposed to look like. I know what um, orders to follow during certain types of emergency. I was prepared with a manual that was provided to me, um, things that we have practiced time and time and time again. Um, during an emergency, you agree that it is vital um, that we have a quick response and a unified coordination um, that has clear communications, correct? No question. I was struck by the written, your written testimony when you said the DC National Guard was delayed because Millie McCarthy and McConville believe that the President of the United States might deploy the National Guard improperly <coughs> on that day and had taken measures to prevent this. This must have been incredibly frustrating for you and for your colleagues in the Guard. Uh, why do you think senior military leaders believe the President of the United States might employ the National Guard improperly on January 6th? Uh, was it based on their words, um, actions, or both? Uh, why do I? So I, I think that I, I think that belief was irrational because I don't believe the president ever gave any of them an unlawful order. Okay, he, he um, gave none of them an unlawful order. Secretary, he appointed, he, he Secretary appointed all of them the to high office. Uh, Ryan McCarthy to testified they, that on January 6th, select committee, uh, that at one point he was walking down the Pentagon hallways, and one of the most seasoned reporters asked him whether the army was planning to seize ballot boxes. Do you know if ideas like the president seizing ballot boxes was something Secretary McCarthy was considering when making decisions about deploying the guard on January 6th? I, I, I think it was, but I think it was not a rational belief. I, I okay. think so, so Secretary McCarthy but, but was says- Was there widespread fear within well, the Department of Defense about the president using the military or no. other lovers of uh, the state to impact the election around the time of the 2020 uh, election? No, so it was not a widespread fear. It was a fear among a clique of officers led by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who, said, who talked about a so-called right stag moment. Okay, and, uh, well, let who, me tell you, the New York Times reported on, in January 2022 that President Trump actually directed his attorney, Rudy Giuliani, to ask the Department of Homeland Security to see if it could legally take control of voting machines in key swing states. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to enter uh, this New York Times article entitled Trump had role in weighing proposals to seize voting machines into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Command Sergeant Major Brooks, um, you served in the Army and Army National Guard for 29 years. You spent the months after January 6th right here on this Capitol Hill protecting the Citadel of Democracy. I understand that for the entire time that you were deployed, you slept in your office, with the exception of maybe one week over the course of months, a patriot who loves our country. How did you feel watching the Capitol get overrun, knowing that you were almost walking distance away but not permitted to come assist law enforcement in defending it? It was very disheartening to, to see. I believe it was something that, you know, I think any, any of us who serve in the military was something that we didn't think we would see in our lifetime. It was very frustrating to know that we had the capability and the personnel and unable to respond. It's, Thank you. It's um, Brigadier General Aaron uh, Dean, uh, what is the basis and rationale on which the Department of Defense and DC National Guard rely in determining the equipment, tactics, techniques, and procedures that the Guard could use to respond to escalations in the protest on January 6th. Was this atypical? I don't think this was, I don't think it, it wasn't atypical. We I, were just months of, we right now are just months away from the 2024 election and the man who incited the 2020 insurrection is on the ballot again. What corrective actions has the National Guard Bureau of Department of Defense taken to ensure the National Guard can plan, coordinate and execute command and control in response to threats in the national uh, capital region? 
I can only really talk about the, the District of Columbia National Guard and its preparation, especially around January 6th. We match capability with request. So if there's a request, we match the capability that we have. Uh, and we had riot control capability on that day to provide services for the Capitol. So you would say that over the last four years, the smoke has been cleared and everyone is clear on how to respond and politics will not take um, uh, priority over necessity. I can say that the District of Columbia National Guard is always ready to respond. Thank you, um, sir. And, and was ready even before that date. Thank you, and I yield back. Generally, the yields back now recognize uh, Congressman D'Esposito of New York. Five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question for everyone. We could start and just go down the line. Um, did you testify in front of the uh, January 6th Select Committee? No, I received a phone call. Uh, you say testified. I, I, I had an informal interview with the committee. Right, but, but it was, it you was not my close, correct? Sorry, second. If you could move the mic closer, please. We'll give you a couple extra seconds. So the, the answer, the Command no. Sergeant, was no? No. Colonel, you were interviewed but never in front of the committee? Correct. Brigadier General? No. Captain? Informally interviewed but never in front of the committee. Okay, got it. So as the chairman mentioned in his opening remarks, we are here today to not only correct the record but also make sure that we are better prepared today than we were, right? We want to be better prepared as a nation, uh, as an agency. We want to be better prepared for the next, uh, God forbid, incident than we were that day, uh, not really to focus on President Trump. That's not really what we're here for today. So Captain Nick, in your opening testimony, or the one submitted to the committee, you said that at about 2.30 conference call, and I quote, Lieutenant General Piat and Lieutenant General Flynn while on the call, discussed how they did not like the optics. They stated it would be in their best military advice to recommend to the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, to deny the request from Command General William Walker to deploy the DC National Guard and aid the United States Capitol Police in the restoration of ordered liberty, or of some called on this committee, democracy, on Capitol Hill. Major Brooks, during the bipartisan transcribed interview the subcommittee conducted in March 2024, you were asked if you recall hearing the word optics on your 2.30 p.m. phone call. You responded, yes, and I quote, General Flynn and General Piat both made numerous comments about the optics of having the Guard on the Capitol and how they would much prefer that the Guard relieve MPD officers elsewhere in the city so that they could respond to the Capitol, close quote. For everyone, and we'll start with uh, Command Sergeant Major Brooks, why would these military experts want to send the National Guard to relieve MPD officers elsewhere after the Capitol was breached at 2.12 p.m.? In my opinion, it was a senseless recommendation. The logistics and the amount of time it would have taken to replace individual MPD officers across the city would have taken way too much time and it would have been further delayed. I think the, the, key, the key term there is senseless. Yeah. Colonel. So their, their whole attitude was that this mission was for law enforcement. They never wanted DC Guard to be in the streets in the first place. They didn't ever want to approve the 350. They thought this was a law enforcement mission. They, they, they believed it, it would have required 100,000 demonstrators before the DC Guard was necessary. And that was, that was the Army's thinking. So they wanted, and they, and they also said they wanted no involvement in the politicization of the, uh, or no involvement in the electoral certification process. No, they wanted no DOD role there. So that was their attitude. So we were not allowed to be east of 9th Street, so, which is where the Capitol is. We were not, you know, we had to have the Secretary of the Army's approval to move three unarmed guardsmen one block. Right, so sounds like baseless decisions. Brigadier General. So I did hear the word optics, and they did use it, um, especially, um, uh, uh, specifically, um, General Pyatt, I know, said optics. And his concern was he did not want um, soldiers or airmen on the Capitol grounds with the Capitol in the background. And so they were giving every other reason why we should be around the Capitol, away from the Capitol, and not responding to the Capitol. And part of what I believe is I believe that they're, un they're unfamiliar with our true capabilities and what we're really designed to do as the National Guard. We're, can, you, can you say that again for everyone to hear? 
I think they're unfamiliar with our true capabilities and what we're designed to do as the as a National Guard under Title 32. Precisely, Captain. It, I did hear the word optics also, and General Pyatt and General Flynn did say it wasn't in their best military advice to recommend to the Secretary at this time to approve that request. And I only have 30 seconds, but I would just like to go down the line once again and ask, answer this question. Was it clear at the time that the number one priority was to restore order and, or to protect the safety of members of Congress, staff, or visitors here at the Capitol complex? Captain. Absolutely. No, no that was not clear. Oh. It, it was clear that we needed to be at the Capitol at that time. Oh, right, you I needed mean, to be, but was that their number one priority? Oh, no, it was not. Brigadier General. Uh, their number one priority was to uh, make the police respond and not the National Guard. Colonel. Absolutely not, Congressman. It was not their priority, sir. Thank you. I think it's clear. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Now recognize Mr. Morelli uh, for his five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to... Uh, to start my question, and I apologize, I only have five minutes, so I'll try to get through this, some of this quickly. But um, first of all, appreciate very much your frustration. Okay. Uh, this was your job to defend the Capitol, and for the reasons both of this hearing and a lot of conversation, you weren't called on to do that. So I can, I, obviously, it's palpable uh, how strongly you feel about this missed opportunity to defend us. And I, I appreciate that, and I don't think there's any disagreement here. You should have been here much sooner. Uh, and I don't certainly don't know that anyone argues that it was your fault that that happened. Um, I, I am a little shocked. Mr. D'Esposito said, we're not here to talk about President Trump. To me, that's a little like asking Mrs. Lincoln, other than the incident, how did you like the play? Um, the truth is the commander in chief could have ordered the National Guard. Um, and as I said earlier, and, and frankly, I think Mr. Griffith said, and I, uh, you know, I'll have to go back and look at the record that the president um, uh, ordered the troops out on January 6th. Uh, there's no evidence anywhere that I've heard of other than him saying it. There's literally no evidence of logs from the White House. There's no evidence anywhere that the president did that. And frankly, look, I, I don't know much about this. I'm a civilian. If I were the president of the United States, as soon as the breach happened, as soon as there was any measure of violence at the Capitol, I would have assembled people in the Situation Room, and I don't care about this. If the Secretary of Defense was there, the Secretary of the Army was there, I'm the Commander in Chief of the United States. And so I, I, would, I guess I'd begin, uh, General Dean, if an order came from the White House, from the President, that deployed the National Guard, would that order have been questioned by anyone? But I, I would answer it this way. I, I would say that, that that order was delegated. The, the, the responsibility of the uh, response from the commanding general was written in a written document to him that basically gave him parameters on what he could do and what he couldn't do. So yeah, now, I, appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I don't believe the delegation of authority exempts the higher authority. If, if a call came from the president or the White House that the president wants this deployed, if the Secretary of Defense were somewhere, the Secretary of Army were somewhere else, would you have ignored that order? No, we wouldn't have. No. Not at all. That's, I, I, look, and I don't want to draw you into it. I'm just saying those who want to absolve the higher levels of command. Likewise, if the Secretary of Army had not acted, but the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Miller had called, and his office had called General Walker and said, deploy the National Guard <coughs> immediately, would anyone have questioned that order? No. Yes. No, we, we, we wouldn't. I'll, I'll speak from from my perspective. Um, we wouldn't have questioned. We wouldn't have questioned it, but we would have wanted it coordinated based on the document that was sent by so you, the so Secretary you, of the Army. So, not to interrupt you, you you would have sought a manner to verify and to make sure that that was legally the appropriate process. But you would have acted on it immediately. No, I think the whole thing was there would have been a conversation, right? Yeah. So there, so there, there was this there was this there was this talk about they needed a con op, right? A concept of operations. Yeah. Well, that's a discussion. In a crisis, that's a discussion. I agree. And so with that, there would have been a discussion about the deployment of the National Guard with any order given by any senior official. Yeah, and I guess I, I get, you know, and I'll, this isn't necessarily a question, um, but what I hear is a lot of confusion between the White House, the Department of Defense, uh, the Secretary of the Army in his office. I don't know what happened. I guess there's varying accounts. Um, and what I think each of you is here to testify is that the order didn't come down. Uh, Congressman, may I speak to that, please, sir? Yeah, go ahead. So, chain of command runs from the President to the Secretary of Defense. Does 
Secretary of the Army to General Walker. Now, the Secretary of Defense authorized the D.C. National Guard to deploy at 3 o'clock. The D.C. Guard was able to deploy at 3 o'clock. Yes. It, it, had the, it had the capability of readiness to go on the street in, at, at 3 o'clock. But the order didn't come from the Secretary of the Army. So that was the, that, that was the, no, I understand. the, the bottleneck there. The president, yeah. the president would follow, follow the chain of command. So typically the president, and I, I must remind no, I, 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 I would say this. Excuse me. I, I'm going to reclaim my time. I apologize. I, is that is that if I were the President of the United States and had ordered it, if that were true, there's no evidence that happened, but let's say it had been ordered and then 20 minutes goes by and nothing's happening, I'll be on the sure. phone again to my secretaries and I'd be on the yeah. phone to General Walker yeah. and say, what's going on? I've ordered you out, move you're, you're, out. And I, I, with all due respect, conversation should have happened. It, it, yeah. I don't know if it did or so, did not. So, but. so, so Congressman, I, I think that, you know, the. Uh, if the president would have called the secretary of the army, the secretary of the army would have said, we're moving as fast as we can. We need to be deliberate. We need to know more information. That's what the secretary of the army said in sworn testimony. But that's, that's not what happened. So, I, so he didn't say that in his testimony. He, he, he did say that in his testimony, sir. No, he didn't. He didn't say the president of the United States ordered him to do no, anything. No, he said that if the president would have, were have called, he said it would not have made a difference. The president, <laughs> the president's call would not have made a difference. Secretary McCarthy. I disagree. Well, Se I, Secretary me, McCarthy, me, I, uh, I, I think you're right also. Respectfully, so, sir, let me reclaim my time. I, in fact, my time is over. But let, the point that I'm trying to make is that I, I don't disagree. This is an important conversation. I don't think it's one for our committee. I think the Armed Services Committee ought to be holding this. And there is a question to make sure that come January 2025, we better be damn sure we have communication that is clear, compelling, and chain of command. But I do think this, there is no way to absolve responsibility of the President, the Secretary of Defense, or the Secretary of the Army. You may dispute what happened, and I think that's fair, but something should have happened that triggered the deployment of the National Guard sooner so that you could have done your jobs and we wouldn't be having this hearing uh, this morning. So with that, I yield back. Chairman yields back, and I agree with him on his last statement that we need to be prepared for uh, the next time that we have uh, January 6th come up, which is in, in the law. I would also uh, correct the record. I did say the president, uh, the gentleman is correct, that's not in the evidence. The president had previously given Christopher Miller the authority to act, as he stated in his uh, testimony, which was previously submitted into the record. And Christopher Miller is the one who gave the order that did not get followed, apparently, by the Secretary of Army. That being said, I now recognize Dr. Murphy for his five minutes of question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize if I'm a little out of breath. It's just being old. Um, thank you all for coming forward. It takes absolute courage, absolute courage. Every damn uh, meeting we have now has Trump derangement syndrome talking to it. This was a, a dereliction of duty by the Secretary of the Army, who refused, by the way, to come before this committee because he knew his culpability. He knew that he lied and he was derelict in the duty. And I, I appreciate from the bottom of my heart you guys standing up for the United States of America. You took an oath to it, as did the Secretary, and you're keeping your oath. So I deeply appreciate it at your own personal cost, because we know the weaponization of this government is occurring at an exponential rate, and it's just privy, it is just proof in the pudding that this is what we're dealing with. I, I, I swear, I, why do we not have bipartisan support in getting to the bottom of this is beyond me. It's everything about Trump. Uh, Captain Nick, you know, the summer before in 2020, when there was an absolute disaster in this country where riots and burning of federal buildings occur, we saw billions of dollars, multiple deaths occur. Speaker Pelosi, I believe, is a culpable with part of this in allowing this, paving the way for the uh, the terrible thing to happen on January 6th to dis just dismiss America's memory of what happened the summer before. In contrast, the protests at Capitol on January 6th, which we know were all wrong, there was no hesitation in creating a politicized community. And we had a former Republican who saw it as a personal grind to go after President Trump, basically not allowing evidence to come before the committee. It's been more than three years and members of the D.C. National Guard are coming forward with your oath to provide clarity. I'll just ask Captain Nick, in your testimony, you mentioned you were a confidential source for the Select Committee. In addition, you go on to state, my, confidential, my confidentiality was breached to the national media. Would you mind expanding upon that? Uh, yes, sir. First, I'd like to correct the record from a previous statement from your colleague when he asked a question about Pentagon officials and their 
um, desire to send troops, I said absolutely. I meant they did not at the time want to send troops to the Capitol, just for clarification. Um, I was informally on, after January 6th, at some time after, I was informally interviewed by the Select Committee on January 6th. I gave informal testimony and hired counsel um, from Tully Rickney, uh, Dan Meyer, who's also behind me. Um, after giving my uh, written notes and, uh, and uh, informal testimony, uh, a couple weeks later, I was contacted by political from a, a, a news outlet from a writer requesting comment on my handwritten notes they got a copy of. Um, I then contacted Dan, who then contacted the select committee to re resolve that. But it, it had to be leaked at some point from pr the, probably the select committee because that's the only people I talked to and gave my notes to. It is, it is obviously evident with anybody with an objective eye that the committee was put forth to tell one thing. If that committee had gone in front of anything in a legal department, you would have cross-examination, other witnesses, et cetera. We never saw any of that to get to the actual truth, which is what all Americans, whether you're which party or not, should believe in doing, period, period. I just want to reiterate something. This is actually, I guess, to uh, Colonel Matthews and... Uh, General Dean, turning to the matter of security, Secretary of the Army and McCarthy have said the D.C. National Guard wasn't, was not prepared for immediate deployment. Do you agree with that statement? That statement is false. We were prepared in many ways. We, we even had backup plans. Uh, um, we call them branches and sequels, right? So um, not only did we have a force that was the Andrews Air Force Base that was training and doing civil disturbance that weekend prepared to deploy on that day, that was ready to deploy on that day. We also um, had traffic control points that were at MPD, and those members had riot control gear in the trunk, not visible to the public, but for their, for their self-protection self in case MPD had to respond, they had the appropriate gear to provide uh, the civil disturbance, riot control um, efforts, if needed. And so we had the capability, we had the planning, uh, we had the know-how. So the question that, that, that I have is, so out of all the events, out of all the inaugurations the District of Columbia National Guard supported, out of all the NATO summits, out of all the IMF protests that we've had, the summer 2020, COVID, we were not able to respond to this. We're incapable. I, I, that's categorically false. I, I find it just, uh, I, my, my time is short, but I just find it a slap in the face to all the good men and women who serve in our armed forces to say you're not prepared. A slap in the face. And because this guy wanted to save his butt with the hope of getting in the Biden administration, that's point blank what happened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back after consultation with Ms. Torres. So we've agreed to do a second round of questioning, and I would recognize Ms. Torres for her additional five minutes of questioning. Um, thank you. Um, the claim that somehow the Select Committee didn't investigate uh, the National Guard response uh, to the security failures at the Capitol on January 6th uh, is inconsistent uh, with the facts. As I mentioned, the Select Committee interviewed 24 individuals and reviewed 37,000 pages of documents related to the National Guard um, on January 6th, um, their response, and 46 of those pages are in the final report that was issued. Um, if you search the transcripts of those interviews held uh, with these witnesses ahead of this hearing, You'll see the significant number of questions used for testimony from the select committee as their foundation. Just because there wasn't a court reporter um, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Um, as I told you in the back room, I was in the balcony um, while all of this was unfolding. Um, I was also witness to an assault on an officer. Um, where the door swung open on balcony that I was sitting. But just because they didn't interview me for that incident doesn't mean that any of those investigations did not happen. But let me just remind everyone, you know, about what the president was putting out on social media during that time. At 2.24 p.m., the president tweeted out regarding Vice President Pence not having the courage to do the wrong thing 
that he was wanted him to do. At 313, um, the president had issued another um, statement saying, I'm asking for everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful, no violence. Remember, we are the party of law and order, respect the law, and our great men and women in blue, thank you. He didn't tell people to go home. He didn't tell them to go home. It took many of his own closest allies to get him to this point. The president didn't want the violence against the police or against members of Congress or against his own vice president to stop. The truth is he wanted the violence to continue until he could take custody and continue to keep custody of his position. At 417, he finally posts a video that contained many lies about the election, but finally encourages people to go home. And that's when they finally started home. Those are the real facts of what happened on that day. So in addition to um, under Democratic leadership, and I know that you want to continue to blame Democrats for what happened on that day, but Democrats did not tell the mob, the angry mob that was armed, to go to the Capitol. The Democrats are not responsible for that. The request, you know, about this January 6 attack to, we have gone back and forth as to who was ordered to do what. Um, that information is very clear. There were no clear directions. Because if there were clear directions, everyone would have moved in unison. Everybody would have been together, putting together those plans that you said already exist. So Colonel Matthews, you seem to want to respond. Please go ahead. Uh, well, well ma'am, I, I just, the, the committee, so the committee interview, again, uh, Sergeant, Commander Sergeant Major Brooks, myself, and Lieutenant Nick, we all told them that there are issues with the credibility of several witnesses, the people who have not been honestly, uh, responded honestly and accurately uh, as part of the investigation, and that was disregarded. And that goes to the credibility of what they were telling the committee. Like, for instance, the, co the committee says, I'm sorry, the, the select committee stated in its, in its findings that our QRF, there was a debatable what its purpose was. There's no debate about that. It was a civil, there was a civil disturbance <coughs> response force. It was designed to respond to a riot. That, and, but, General I, I, I think you're missing the point. There would have been no riot. There would have been no riot had the President of the United States not set up the stage and ordered people and told them that he would join them at the U.S. Capitol. There had been no galley that was erected to hang the Vice President if the President had not want them to stop us from certifying the election. You're missing the point of all of the, what happened six months prior to January 6th. The chaos that was happening within the branches of the military that are sworn to never get involved in domestic affairs. I yield back. The general lead yields. I apologize for a brief absence. I have another committee that a bill got called up right at the worst time that I had to go present. But uh, I think a, a couple of uh, uh, points of clarification. The Capitol breach began uh, well before the people at the at the uh, White House uh, made it down to the Capitol. The gallows were actually erected at six o'clock in the morning, and no one knew exactly what Mike Pence was going to do until about 1:30 in the afternoon. These are just some of the questions of the narrative that came out from the January 6 um, report, which um, is this, this much. This is how much is discussed about the DC National Guard. The primary objective of the select committee was to investigate the security failure at the US Capitol because we have to identify the failures before we can fix things. There was an entire team, the blue team, who is commissioned with doing that. I challenge anyone to look in here and find anything of substance from the blue team whatsoever. So this is why it's important that we do the oversight that is the job 
of Congress and specifically the subcommittee to look into what happened. This is clearly within the security failure of the Capitol. This should not be political. This should not be biased in one way or the other. Regardless of who was coming to the Capitol, regardless of who broke into the Capitol, that should have never happened. There should have been no breach of this Capitol. The resources are here. And the idea that the New Jersey National Guard would get here before our own National Guardsmen whose job is to, as Colonel Matthews said, riot control, traffic control. This is their job to come in and help defend this Capitol. And so um, with that, I do have a few questions here. Um, the DOD IG report alleges that DOD officials did not delay or obstruct a response to the Capitol. Sergeant Major Brooks, I'll start with you. Um, do you believe that the deployment of the DC National Guard was delayed? Yes. Who do you believe delayed it? Um, Secretary McCarthy and senior officials in the Army staff. <laughs> okay. Um, why do you believe that they delayed it? I believe their misunderstanding of the capabilities of DC National Guard and the seriousness of the situation, to be honestly, I have no idea why we never received that order. All I know is that they were more concerned with what it would look like with soldiers with the Capitol in the background than protecting the Capitol of the United States. Colonel Matthews, same question for you. Um, uh, do you believe that deployment of the DC National Guard was delayed? Uh, yes, sir. I, I believe that it was a, uh, a result of an overcautious, uh, reluctant, hesitant, uh, facilitating leadership. And I think they were concerned about the, op the optics, the political optics of a military presence here. And I don't think they trusted the commander in chief. And I think that was because of, of their, uh, the, our senior ranking military officer who was making disparaging remarks about the president to them. You, you got to remember, the people who ran the Army are very close associates of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They owed, this position, they owed their positions to him. And he was not, I mean, it's, there are books about how, he'll, uh, how Chairman Milley was, was, was impeding the ability of, 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 the, uh, of the president. So I, I think that that was, the, that was an issue there, sir. So just, just to clarify, you, you think that there was a delay that, that, that was calculated for one reason or the other, but you're not indicating that there was a nefarious purpose in that. Just, just so we don't walk out of here with conspiracy theories no, that I'm the not. DOD wanted the, uh, <laughs> the capital to fail. I just want to make sure that, no, no, that no, that's, not, no, that's not where you're going with I, that. I'm not that going correct? with that, sir. I'm okay. saying that, I'm saying that the, the conditions were set uh, by um, this, talk, this talk of a, of a coup, of a, of a right stag moment. I mean, the, the idea that, that I mean, to be, let me be frank about it. A bunch of black kids in the D.C. Guard are going to take, going to usurp the election for, for Trump. It's crazy, but that's what they were talking about. I mean, and it, 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 it's, it's crazy talk, and it was out there, and it's in books. I mean, Millie's talked about it. Um, well, well, I've got you, Colonel Matthews. Do you believe the DOD IG report accurately reflect, uh, uh, reflects the events of January 6, so that, 2021? That, that DOD IG report is, is, is replete with incorrect information, false information. Even, even the Select Committee's report has, has shown that. And I, can I give you a couple of examples, please? Sure. It says that 1635, Ryan McCarthy called uh, General Walker and directed him to go to the Capitol. Now, now McCarthy, if you read his uh, transcript from the Select Committee, he said he never did that. He was on a. He was getting ready for a news conference. He was taking notes and writing, writing, and uh, so preparing for a televised news conference. And he he overheard uh, Brigadier General Lenive direct General Walker to go. But General Lenive says he never told General Walker to go. He never gave a go order. So they do like this. They point in each other's directions and say they, so. But the DODIG puts it in. in and then then they claim that they had to call Walker again at 1700, like 25 minutes later, and direct him to go. That's an absolute falsehood. <coughs> McCarthy was in a televised press conference. Mr. Storch, the, the DOD Inspector General, has an obligation to correct the record for, I mean, where does he go, where does General Walker go to get his reputation back? I mean, you smeared this man by anonymous sources, and we're talking about general officers in the Army who were bitter because of Walker's, Walker's testimony in March before the Senate. They didn't like that, and they wanted to get General Pyatt promoted to general, and so they wanted to take down Walker. Even General Milley engages in that. General Milley engages in that, and, and his, if you read his transcript, sir, from the Select Committee, he, he implies Walker was lying or exaggerating. And everything General Milley says in his transcribed interview 
from the committee is incorrect, and the committee staff had to know it. So uh, let me just clarify something here. Um, General um, Walker yes, did testify under oath to the select committee, is that correct? Correct, yes, he did. Um, the implication of the DODIG report is that General Walker falsely testified. Is that fair? Uh, to, to the uh, Senate uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee and to the Senate Rules Committee. He testified okay. in March. Uh, uh, in March of 2021, the DODIG report came in, out in November 2021, and it, the implication was that he was not truthful in his testimony. So, and this is a sitting officer of the Congress of the United States appointed by Speaker Pelosi, a, a sworn career federal law enforcement executive and a major general of the United States Army. Okay. They were implying that he that he, he committed outright perjury on live television. So, and I, I had a, I took exception to that. You know, I wrote my memo, sir. I wasn't working for General Walker. I, just, I mean, I, I had nothing to gain from that, but it, it was the right thing to do. This man was responsible for all your personal safety. He was smeared by, and I just, I just okay. Let, let, let me reclaim my time. There's other questions I need to get to, but I just wanted to make make sure they understand um, that you. you <laughs> The implications of the DODIG report is that General Walker falsified testimony or was not truthful. Would you believe that he would be selected to be the head uh, security officer of the House of Representatives by Nancy Pelosi if it was known that he had lied under oath? No, okay, no, I just want to make sure no, we're, we're talking about someone who was selected by, uh, my, by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to be the the uh, sergeant at arms here. This, I'm just getting a point. This this is a bipartisan issue that we're talking about here. Let me move on real quickly. Um, uh, Captain Nick, the DODIG states they received a copy of contemporaneous notes from Secretary McCarthy's aide de camp from January 6, 2021. Did the DODIG request a copy of your notes that day? No. They I did never, not ask for your notes. I never spoke to anybody at the Department of Defense uh, IG's office, and they never requested my notes and they never contacted me. No, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, I'll do a couple uh, more questions and we'll continue down the aisle. Um, the DODIG report alleges that on June 20, in, in June of 2020, that June 2020 taught Secretary McCarthy that he could not simply rely on the DC National Guard to figure out the details. General Dean, what do you make of that statement? I think that he's unfamiliar with what the DC National Guard can actually do in its, in its true capability. Um, so I think he's probably being advised by uh, active, senior active, active component officers that have never spent a day in their life in the National Guard. And they're advising him on what the National Guard should or shouldn't do. It's like a surface warfare officer in the Navy talking about a submariner. Um, you're in the same service, but you do different things. And so I think part of the issue is, is taking military advice from a senior uh, active component officer about National Guard issues pertaining to civil disturbance or domestic response, um, I think it's out of their wheelhouse, and I think sometimes they can provide inaccurate information. And in doing so, it creates this lack of trust because now you don't know who to believe. You don't know whether to believe the people that are actually supposed to advise you on military matters or the National Guard. But I would, I would propose to you that you need somebody to um, advise you on Army and Air Force National Guard matters, not just military matters, if you uh, want to get to the truth. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sergeant Major Brooks, same question, but let me proceed that with. There were a lot of acts of violence, riots throughout the country during 2020. Um, we had that in, uh, in Georgia. As a response to the riots in Atlanta, the, the governor of Georgia called out the state patrol and the Georgia National Guard. No one raised an issue with that because that is a job of the National Guard to respond to the governor and uh, provide for civil disturbance and support and riot control. Is really the same question I did to General Dean. Is that not understood by certain DOD officials that ultimately that is the same role as the DC National Guard, it's just the chain of command is differently since DC is not a state? Yes, sir. The the D.C. National Guard is unique in that aspect. In fact, there are actual D.C. code that gives special authorities to the D.C. National Guard that no other National Guard, National Guard in the country have to conduct business within the district and conduct law enforcement operations in support of, you know, federal or uh, district agencies. 
I believe that General Dean is absolutely accurate. Um, I asked the question, where was the Chief of the National Guard Bureau in this when you were discussing guard capabilities? You were only acting, asking active duty military who had never served in the Guard, did not truly understand capabilities and authorities, and at no time you reached out to the four-star general in charge of the National Guard to get information. Although you had all the information necessary, if you just understood the role that had been delegated to you many months or even years prior to. I think it is incredibly important going forward that the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Army, the Chief of Staff of the Army, to include the Sergeant Major of the Army, are thoroughly briefed on the authorities, capabilities, and their responsibility that has been delegated to them over the DC National Guard and its ability to respond to the nation's capital. We thoroughly train on our ability to be a reserve force for the active component. Why does the active component not thoroughly train on us? Thank you. Um, appreciate uh, the thorough answers there. Very important issue. I now recognize the full committee ranking member, Ms. Morelli, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I'll admit uh, I'm a simple guy. And I do want to uh, do some follow-ups to Mr. Loudermilk's questions, which were important. Um, also recognize that General Walker was in held such high esteem by members of our side of the aisle. We made him the Sergeant at Arms after January 6th. So I think we have as much faith in him and had as much faith in him as all of you did uh, during that time. The way I see this, and maybe I'm wrong, uh, if I'm the President of the United States, the Commander in Chief, even though I've delegated authority, I think at some period after 3 o'clock, when I see that there doesn't seem to be much movement, I'm going to pick up the phone and call the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Army and say, exactly what's going on? Well, I've issued orders, or I haven't, or there's confusion. At some point, I would have had the, the, my Chief of Staff call General Walker and say, exactly what's happening on the ground? Well, my only point is, it would not have taken me, and I'm, again, I'm not sophisticated, but it wouldn't have taken me three and a half hours while I'm sitting in the White House watching this unfold, confident in my view that while I've signed the necessary papers, so I'm not sure what's happening, but it's all good because I signed the papers. This is an attack on the United States Capitol, the citadel of democracy here in this country and around the world. So I just, for all the other misdirection here, and I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting that we're trying to bring the president into this unnecessarily, it's that the president is necessarily part of the chain of command. By the way, so is the Secretary of Defense, and so is the Secretary of the Army. So I'm not absolving them. They clearly had direct line responsibility to make sure this happened. And at some point, when this is going on, in the midst of the chaos, if only a few minutes goes by and something's not happening, I'm picking up the damn phone. I'm gonna find out exactly what's going on. But to this point, so look, I, we have high respect, the greatest respect for General Walker. We would have continued him as Secretary or Sergeant of Arms. Um, it was my friends over there who made the decision to, to remove him, and that's fine. They have that responsibility. So let me ask this, and maybe um, I'm not sure anyone can answer this, but let me direct it first to, uh, uh, to uh, Sergeant Major Brooks. Um, what, tell me what the protocol should be going forward, since we're all focused on what's supposed to happen. Tell us in the future, whether it's January 6, 2025, or any other day that involves a breach of the Capitol or issues here, what's the protocol? What, what should we know needs to be in place that people fear wasn't? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? What's the protocol like? One positive step that I believe has already been taken is I believe they have given the authority to the chief of the Capitol Police to call on the Guard without further approval. That's a huge step. Um, secondly, I believe that the D.C. National Guard has been neglected for many years for what I believe to be the lack of knowledge or understanding. It was put on a shelf. Those who were delegated authority over, the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of Defense, did not thoroughly understand their responsibility. You know, they're ultimately one of the commanders, one of the senior leaders of the D.C. National Guard. 
over the 17 years that I served in the D.C. National Guard, repeatedly the National Guard Bureau came down and removed units, military police units that would respond to the Capitol, have removed them from the D.C. National Guard without objection. If, if the governor of your state was told they were going to move one of their guard units, your governor would be upset and there would be a significant challenge to that, correct? The Secretary of the Army is supposed to be our governor. Is supposed to defend the D.C. National Guard from losing its capability to support and defend the capital of the United States. That has been neglected for decades, and it needs to change. The D.C. National Guard should be the elite unit that it, should, that it was designed to be under President Thomas Jefferson. It is responsible for the seat of democracy. It's not responsible for a state, a territory. It's responsible for a city. It is the only guard that is responsible for a city. It just happens to be the capital of the most powerful nation in the world. And I think that's significant. And if, you, if, if that change does not come, if this happens again, and unfortunately in our political environment, I think there's a chance. Well, and I, I appreciate that response, and I'm almost out of time. I would simply say this, that I also think leading up to January 6th, recognizing the tumult, recognizing the challenges, uh, from the President to the Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of the Army, there should have been a lot of work in preparation for, not on that day, but in the weeks, months leading up to make sure the lines of communication were set and that there was a series of protocols that would be followed if and when things happened, and that clearly didn't happen as well. But again, uh, gentlemen, I appreciate all of your, not only testimony for being here today, but your long service and support of the United States. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields now. Recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. So I submit to you, gentlemen, that if the President of the United States had gone outside the chain of command and called General Walker directly, bypassing his uh, acting Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Army, we might very well be in a hearing trying to find out why the President was interfering with the National Guard. Would you agree with that, Commander Sergeant Major? I think that would have been a highly irregular. Oh. It would have been highly irregular, Colonel. S sir, yes, sir. Yeah, keep in mind, this, we're, during that time, they were talking about the president improperly using the military, and they wanted to take precautions against that, th that use. So they, they wouldn't have it both ways, to say he didn't call, but if he would have called, they would have said he was trying to interfere with the chain of command. So, hey. Eric, exactly. That's exactly what I was hearing, uh, and I just wanted to put it, make sure we had it on the record. I, I, I uh, put on the record previously in my previous line of questions that all of you were there for, with uh, Major General William Walker from 1.49 p.m. through 5.55 p.m. During that time period, we've already established that he didn't receive any calls from uh, Secretary McCarthy, but did he try to reach out to Secretary McCarthy during that time frame? Did any gentleman, did you all witness any attempts by him to reach out? Yes. Not that I'm saying it's his duty, I'm just asking for facts. You want to go? You want to go? Captain? Uh, yes, sir. I witnessed General Walker attempting to reach out to the Secretary's office multiple times. Multiple times? Yes, sir. Yeah, sir in, yes, sir. In, Colonel? In fairness to uh, Secretary McCarthy, and I, I wrote a memo and I said he was incommunicado, and I wasn't taking a shot at him there. I was saying the Pentagon is a big building. Cell phones don't work. If you're in a skiff in the, in the Pentagon, you're not going to be reachable by cell phone. And if he's in a, in a skiff with the chairman or with the Secretary of, the, of Defense, it's reasonable he would not be able to be reached except through his front office, and, and the aide goes back and relays information. So I, I gave Secretary McCarthy the benefit of the doubt there. And, you know? and I appreciate that, and appreciate you bringing Look, we're just trying to get the facts. Yeah. Brigadier General, my understanding is, is that you would have been uh, second in command behind Major General Walker. Is that correct? That is correct. And if for some reason, because we, we heard earlier that uh, as a part of the DOD IG report, that um, that there were attempts to reach uh, General Walker, uh, which you all said didn't happen. But let's assume for the sake of argument that they couldn't reach him for some unknown reason. Wouldn't the proper move then have been to call you in this case of an emergency where orders have been given to activate the National Guard? That is correct. And it's interesting because the report says, and, I, and I, I'm not a military man, so y'all Bear with me, I may be asking something that y'all all know and I don't. And that is that uh, 
the Major General Walker indicated that he had called to initiate movement. Now, I understand there wasn't a call, but what does initiate movement mean? Does that mean to get into the, in, to go lend assistance? What exactly does that mean, Brigadier General Dean? Initiate movement means that you um, actually give the order for a force to move. So in this case, it would have been our QRF or any force that was qualified to do civil disturbance. You give them the So order that would have been the order to, to head to the Capitol that and would have been lend the assistance. Yes. Okay. I mean, that's, that's why I asked. I wanted to, to know. Um, and Captain Nick, I think this is in the record, but let's just get it out there again. What time did the D.C. National Guard learn that they were authorized to deploy to the Capitol? I wrote down in my notes 5.09 p.m., which was relayed from General Mc McConville on a secure video teleconferencing line in our office. 5.09 p.m. Now, they've asked if the president, uh, the questions from the other side indicated the president, if there wasn't any action, should have jumped the chain of command and called uh, General Walker. But if, if you are uh, Pyatt or Flynn and you knew that, that there was supposed to be a deployment or in, in initiate the, the move, wouldn't you have reached out to somebody if you couldn't get a hold of Walker? And I understand they were on the call the whole time, but wouldn't they have been able to, to properly call Brigadier General Dean? I'll let anybody answer. But uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sergeant, yes, sir. I, I, think, I think we miss a key point in all of this conversation when we're talking about who and what. When we go back to the significant fact that the only reason why we are here today is because Secretary McCarthy, in his approval letter, removed Major General's ability to execute his immediate response authority. Secretary McCarthy changed the memo from Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of the Army. The one that we got from Secretary McCarthy stated that Major General Walker could not deploy the QRF without the Secretary of the Army's explicit order. And, uh, I will just clarify, the term immediate response there is probably using it correctly in, in this instance. Immediate re emergency response. Yeah, so, but, correct. Yeah. And, just, and, when was, clear, and when was that memo or order given, to not do anything without the, the direct call from the Secretary of the Army? Uh, January 5th. Fifth or four, uh, I think I think the memos that several days fifth. before January sixth. Yes. Fifth, sir. Yes, sir. All right. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate you all. Thank you very much for your courage to be here today. I know that it's got to put you all under a lot of stress. I yield back. Gentleman Niels now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. D. Esposito, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sergeant Major Brooks, at the time you were the most senior non-commissioned officer in the organization. Can you share briefly? Uh, what was happening at the D.C. Armory between uh, 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. on January 6th? Immediately upon receiving the 149 call from Chief Sun, we, the D.C. National Guard, on our own accord, initiated movement from the QRF from Air Force, uh, Andrews Air Force Base, to the Armory. So they were there. We were then taking the soldiers that were coming in for the second shift that were already at the Armory. We had geared them uh, fully kitted them with riot control gear. We had moved our transportation onto the armory drill floor so that not to arise, uh, arouse any, you know, any public awareness of what was actually going on. And they were loaded and standing by ready to go. They had been divided up into uh, civil disturbance platoons, uh, roughly 40 to 45 people per platoon with appropriate leadership, which coincidentally matches the MPD force structure for civil disturbance as well because as We've stated previously we trained with them, so we wanted to be as close to uh, their force package as possible. Right. You train with them to do the work that you're prepared to do, which is exactly the opposite of what so-called leadership was telling you your mission was. Yes, but I, I think they, they'd they like to say this untrained, and you know they point to us conducting them training, and some soldiers may or airmen may have had their first experience of training. The Army and Air Force get new, brand new privates and airmen every day. They are assimilated into the formation and trained and trust that their leaderships have their best interest and would not put them in a situation that they were not prepared for. I believe that our leadership, all the way down the chain, prepared our soldiers and airmen as best as possible to perform the mission that they were given. So on January 6th, between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., they were trained, they were prepared, and they were ready to respond. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Brigadier General Dean, according to his testimony to the DOD, Secretary McCarthy told uh, to General Walker to, quote, posture his troops and, quote, get ready to go on the 2.30 call. Is that accurate? That is not accurate. There was no mention, well, first of all, um, mm -hmm. Secretary McCarthy wasn't even on the call. Um, I'll say this, he wasn't identified on the call, nor did he speak on the call. Understood. Um, Colonel Matthews. Yes, sir. If I leave anything out here, please correct me. You were acting general counsel to the Army. Yes, sir. You were principal deputy general counsel. Correct. You were deputy ledge counsel to the, uh, to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Deputy legal counsel, yes, sir. Okay. You were special counsel to the director of national intelligence. Yes. You served this country faithfully in combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. I did, sir. You're a Nova grad. Yes, sir. All right. And you're a Harvard law grad. Don't hold it against me. Pretty well accomplished. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You have a minute and 40 seconds, sir. Yes, sir. You were in charge on January 6th. Tell me your plan and what you would have done differently. In charge of the D.C. Guard, the Army, the what, or what? You could have made any decision necessary in order to keep this place safe. I, I would have picked up the phone and told the D.C. Guard to move, deploy the Capitol immediately, and I would have told General Walker to, to uh, have everyone in the building kitted up in Ryan Gear and get down to support Capitol Police. And I, I, I will say this, sir. At 304, Secretary Mueller did give the Army authorization to go to the Hill. That was not conveyed to, the, that was not conveyed to uh, General Walker. So that authorization ha had been given. Uh, Secretary uh, Miller had all the authority he needed. He didn't he needed to hear from the president. The president had given him the authority he needed to act. I would argue he had that authority even without talking to the president based on the executive order. So I, I mean, I think I think that uh, um, there was a bottleneck, and it, and it wasn't at the D.C. Guard level, and it wasn't at the uh, OSD level, in my opinion. Well, I, I guess again, the the goal here today was to make sure that we are better prepared uh, next time. Brigadier, I'm sorry, Brigadier General, you have one? So, yeah, so can, can, can I answer that just real quick? So, to me, um, what I would have done if I was in a position over at the Pentagon, I would have, or if I was, or if I was the Secretary, I would have given, I would I, one, I would have given um, General Walker more latitude. I wouldn't have written a, a memo so, con, so constraining that it would take one person to, you know, mobilize the D.C. National Guard. Well, that was clearly done by design. Right. And secondly, what I would have done, I would, I would have given him the authorization to deploy if there was a threat to life or limb. And then I would have said, when you get there, then give me a call and we'll discuss how the D.C. National Guard is actually going to be deployed. And well, that's my, the con op. My time's expired. I want to thank you all for your service to this great country. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Um, <clears throat> I've just got a, 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 some closing questions and then we will uh, we'll adjourn after that. Um, I just want to do a quick review before I ask these, uh, these last couple of questions. Um, from the information that we obtained from the Select Committee on January 6th, transcribed interviews, logs from DOD officials, um, we have a timeline of the authorization process of the National Guard. We know on January 3rd that uh, President Trump um, ordered that the uh, Guard be readied for potential deployment based on intelligence that had been received. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Secretary Miller um, did uh, testify to the Select Committee. He had full authorization to deploy the National Guard um, on January 6th, did not need any additional authority from the President of the United States. There was a breakdown in an order. Uh, Secretary Miller testified that he gave an order to deploy uh, the National Guard to the Capitol. Somewhere there was a breakdown in that order, whether it was communication or a delay. Uh, Sergeant Major Brooks, if uh, General Walker were to give you a direct order, you lawfully, and according to your oath, same oath I took when I joined the military, you were obligated to carry out that lawful order, is that correct? Yes, sir. Any moral, legal authority uh, order given is my responsibility to carry out, yes, sir. If you did not carry out that order, would that be considered dereliction of duty? Absolutely, and General Walker could take action against me, yes, sir. Uh, do you feel that there was dereliction of duty in the chain of command on January 6th? Not within the D.C. National Guard, sir, but from higher levels, yes, sir, I do believe that 
senior officials within the Secretary of the Army and senior officials in the Army staff were derelict in relaying the authorization from Secretary Miller down to the appropriate level of execution, which would have been Major General Walker, sir. Okay. Hey, I know that's hard. It's a difficult question, and, and I apologize for that. But uh, to get to the truth, we need to know uh, what really happened. Uh, another, while we're here, um, and, and this is open to anyone that can answer this appropriately, and, and maybe I'll direct it to uh, General Dean to start with. Um, Secretary McCarthy claims that he was making a tactical level CONOP plan at the MPD headquarters. Did you ever see this plan? Not only did I not see the plan, um, he was at the wrong agency. So the lead federal agency for this particular event was the Capitol Police. Right. So my question is, is why are you at the MPD headquarters and not at Capitol Police? Because the Capitol Police has a responsibility for the security of the Capitol. Okay, that, would, that was my follow-up question because uh, the, the deployment was to the Capitol. So did General Walker ever discuss a plan with uh, anyone? Yes. Okay, Sir. Sergeant Brooks. Oh, yes, or, or who, I'm sorry, whoever. Uh, was, was that you? Okay, I'm sorry, Colonel. Yes, sir. Yeah. It was, it was the plan was get your, <laughs> get, get your riot gear on and get on the bus and go support Chief Stevenson at the, at the Capitol. Take orders from any white shirt or, or senior officer in the Capitol Police Department. That was the plan. That's what we did. That's what we eventually did. Okay, so, and we have Chief Sund here. Thank you for attending today, Chief, and for your service. Once the National Guard deploys, you become under the authority of the U.S. Capitol Police. You're sworn in then, right? You're, you're officers of the U.S. Capitol Police. So your operation plan, in reality, I guess, is get from here to there, get sworn in, and do whatever Chief Sun tells you. Is that a good summary of it? Follow well, lawful order, sir. So the D.C. Guard never acts independently. We always take direction from civil authority. So we work for somebody uh, right. in the civilian side. So we would have taken direction from, that's, that's what we did during the summer of 2020. We worked for the MPD all over the city, responding to riots in the city, or for the uh, Secret Service Police or Park Police. Okay, so just make sure I understand, there was a discussion of an op plan, very simple op plan, get on the bus, get to the Capitol, get sworn in, and get to work. That's I, I, the I extent of really an op plan that you need, is that what you're saying, Sir Brooks? That, yes, there, we, we Due to our normal planning operations, we already had a, a rally point identified for the soldiers who are on traffic control points within the city. All we had to do to was communicate to those service members to rally at that point, don your riot gear. Everyone else at the armory would have been donning their riot gear and moving towards their direction. Exactly as Colonel Matthews mentioned, once we arrived, we fall under, it's called defense support to civil authorities. Once we arrive, we fall under the, we are supporting the civil authority, in this case, the Capitol Police would have given us direction on where to be and what to do. Okay, thank you. This is my last question, and, and uh, again, General Dean, I'll start with you since you were the senior member that would have been there at the time. The order that finally came at uh, five, what, what time was it again? Uh, 509. Cap Captain Nick, 509? Correct, I wrote 509 down okay. in my the wheel book. General Dean, at 5.09, did, did Secretary McCarthy give, you, give uh, General Walker the order at that time? If not, can you explain how you got the order? My understanding is that um, General McConville actually gave the order, but he said he received it from um, Secretary McCarthy. And General, uh, General Walker, in turn, told me, and I, in turn, told the, the quick response force, it's time to move. Okay. It, it, sir, does anybody sir, else? So, sir, I was, I was sitting right next to uh, uh, General Walker in the conference room in the BTC when General McConvo, no, General McConvo is not in the chain of command, so it wasn't his order. He was conveying an order that, uh, that we were to, uh, uh, authorized to go, and I was told that it came from not, not from Secretary McCarthy, but from Secretary Miller, uh, that we had the authorization to go. That's what I was told at the time. Uh, and so I, this claim that uh, Secretary McCarthy called General Walker. Obviously, it was not true because, as Secretary McCarthy has stated, it was not true. He did not call General Walker. That and and the way we got it, it was it, it was relayed via BTC, a, a video teleconference. Okay, so somebody called you up on video teleconference to give you that order. Oh, then no, no. Uh, the, the conference was ongoing. It was running, and General McConville, Chief of Staff of the Army, happened to be on a conference talking to us. And he mentioned that we had the author authorization to go. So, okay, so he just was like, "What are y'all doing still here? Are you supposed no, no, to go?" He, or? That, no, he claims that, but that's not what happened, sir. Okay. He, someone in the back of the room said, "Oh, these guys are good to go now. You're good to go." He, he said, "We're good to go." He he claimed later that 
he asked General Walker, why are you still here? Uh, you, are, you, you already have the authority? That was not the case. We, General Walker did not, I mean, he implied that Walker had the authority, 1635 from McCarthy. He was, he was just hanging out on, on the VTC while, while twiddling his thumbs while, while the city was being, was, uh, okay. in the right condition. Well, Sir, thank you. Miss, Mr. Chairman, can I? Yes, can I, yes absolutely. Can I add that it, it all doesn't make sense if you follow this through the chain because if Major General Walker had been told numerous times had been given a lawful order to do something, why was there never an action taken against Major General Walker for dereliction of duty or refusing a lawful order? There never was. There was never even an inkling of charging him with anything. So that, that whole narrative that we were just sitting around waiting is, is false. It, it, and, it's, and it's disrespectful to the men and women that did that job to think that we just sat and waited while the Capitol was under attack. Sir, sir my point out, Walker no. told me that you know, he was that he he wanted to send him anyway and and, uh, and and resign and I asked him not to do that. I said, sir, don't do that. Wait for the order. He actually told me the same thing. So he Absolutely. said he asked me. He said, should I send him? Should I send him? Should I send him? I'm gonna send him. I said, don't send them. You didn't get the order. It's in writing that you can't send them. Don't send them. Okay. Um, I want to thank you all. I would. I'll do these and I'll recognize you for that. Um, I do want to enter for the record uh, a memorandum from the Secretary of the Army dated January 4th, 2021 is the employment guidance for the District of Columbia National Guard. Um, also, a um, letter from the Secretary of the Army uh, to uh, Major General William Walker. Um, dated January 1, 2021, uh, recommending approval of the request of Mr. Christopher Rodriguez, Director of District Columbia Homeland Security Emergency Management on behalf of, uh, uh, this is support of the civil authorities of District of Columbia. Without objection, so entered, I recognize the ranking member. Um, thank you, Chairman. I have uh, a few items I'd like to enter to, um, to the record. Um, thank you, and I want to also acknowledge and say thank you um, to everyone that is here today. We know that the chaos at the Pentagon was caused by the Commander-in-Chief and the fear that he would Im involve the military and domestic um, political affairs. I want to enter into the record the following um, articles, a political, uh, political article entitled, Trump could have helped response to the January 6th riot, but didn't, per new testimony. Without objection. Um, a letter dated December 30th, 2022, and posted on the Select Committee website from the Select Committee to the General Counsel of the Department of Homeland Security related to the disposition of interview transcripts. Uh, pages 99 to 101 of Acting Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller's interview with the Select Committee, an article from PolitiFact in which it declares a false the claim that the January 6th Committee suppressed testimony from Anthony Ornato that proves former President Donald Trump pushed for 10,000 National Guard troops at the Capitol. A CNN article entitled Trump's Defense Secretary denies that there were orders to have 10,000 troops ready to deploy on January 6th. A Washington Post article entitled The False GOP Claim That Pelosi Turned Down National Guard Before January 6th Attack. An email from Mark Meadows to John Acoff dated January 5th, 2021, in which he says that the National Guard will be activated so they can protect pro-Trump people. Appendix 2 of the Select Committee to Investigate the January 6th Attack Final Report and summaries of the many Capitol Police Inspector General reports requested by Democratic leadership of this committee last Congress. Without objection. Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank each of our witnesses, the whistleblowers, for coming forward to share their story. Again, for anyone who is watching who wishes to share their story with my subcommittee, please do not hesitate to reach out at cha.house.gov slash whistleblower dash support. To our whistleblowers, members of our committee may have additional questions for you, and we ask that you respond to those questions in writing. Without objection, each member will have five legislative days to insert additional material into the record or to revise and extend their remarks. If there is no further business, I thank the members for their participation. And without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>